Let's pray. Father, we're venturing into the unknown in these next few moments. May the answers that I give honor your word and honor you. And may it allow us to think about how we process our lives and uh, how we make decisions as we look to you and your word to help us. And may what we do, whether it's these next few moments or what we do after we leave, may they honor Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. There's a joy to actually scheduling sermons and knowing what you're going to say and you have some kind of control over what you're going to do. And then there's the moment when you sit down with your worship leader and go, hey, how about the week after Christmas? We let them decide where you kind of are uh, going without a net. So the questions that I'm about to answer are questions that came from the pews next to you, maybe from your own hand. Um, I'm going to try to keep two principles in place. Uh, that have been uh, principles of our restoration heritage. One, if the Bible's silent on it, I'm going to try to stay as silent as I can, or at least let you know that this is more speculation, and I don't have a concrete, let's say, it's the Lord on this. And second, we believe the Bible is the ultimate authority on the answers to these questions, so I'm going to try to make sure that my answer is biblically based. All right? So with that said, it's now time to go to the cards and see what we have here. First person, I think, felt that I was looking for an idea for a sermon series because I got a great title, I got a great perspective here. Basically, this is like we're going to try to teach Acts 1 through 8. Uh, instead of a question, the phrase is, Christians, the new frontier going where no Jew has gone before. I see what they were doing there, playing to my geeky Star Trekness. The question is, what's the journey of the Christians from the death of Christ to Paul's transformation, which I would consider his conversion, found in Acts 9. Uh, so what was that? Uh, we could start a whole sermon series on Acts, but let me at least give you an outline that will cover the first eight verb chapters and really lead you through the rest of Acts, maybe give you a little overview. Um, and I'll give it to you in like a sermonic outline form. First, if you want to play with this Star Trek idea, they're given the prime directive in Acts 1 8, where Jesus tells them that they will be his witnesses. So the book becomes about the fact that the apostles' action is that of witnesses. When they receive the Holy Spirit, there's their power. And that's going to start in Jerusalem. It will go out to Samaria, which are kind of like the half cousins, the kind of people you see at the holidays that you don't want them to be there, the kind of the relationship between the Jews and Samaritans. And then even scarier is to the most remotest outward parts of the world, which is the exact opposite understanding of a Jew who Israel is where you're supposed to stay, that's the promised land, this is the land of separation. So they're being told you're going to go back out and scatter about. And it comes away as witnesses in two directions. One is proclamation. You get the summary after the sermon of Pentecost that this is the early history of the church in Acts 2:46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, which gave them the opportunity to witness both physically with what they were, or verbally with what they were saying, but also they become witness in the way they take care of and the community that develops around them. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, they were praising God, they were enjoying the favor of all the people, and that leads to increase as the Lord was favoring them and adding to their number daily. But that doesn't mean that everyone favored them. And the second thing that begins in chapter 3 is persecution. So they become witnesses of a proclamation, what they say about Jesus, how they live for him, but also what do they do under the pressure of persecution. Starting in Acts 3 with the Sanhedrin, and then it develops much stronger by the time we get to Acts 7, where we start to see not just the apostles, but some of those early uh, church leaders, possibly the first deacons in Acts 6 where Stephen finds himself proclaiming the message of Jesus publicly, and he is killed for his action, which will actually push uh, everyone except the apostles out of Jerusalem, move them on to Samaria, uh, where Philip will also, while in Samaria, be called to speak to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8. So if we're talking about the journey, I would say that's the journey. They're given their prime directive. They then proclaim the message and how they live, and then, oddly enough, I'm supposed to go through Saul's conversion, and interestingly, Acts 8 talks about that persecution. It says, 
And Saul was there giving approval of his, Stephen's death. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem, and they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And as Paul comes on the scene, then in chapter 10, Peter will take the message <laughs> to the first full Gentile convert in Cornelius, and then Paul will take the message into northeast uh, or into northwest Asia, in what we know as, Tur as Asia Minor or Turkey. And while there, he'll take the message to uh, Europe. And if Acts 1-8 is an outline for the book, then he takes it to the uttermost parts of the world when Paul proclaims the message of the gospel in Acts chapter 28 in the last place you would think the gospel would ever take, in the capital of Rome, the great empire itself. All right? So hopefully that answered that sermon series idea question effectively. Playing with the idea of my geekness in Star Trek, I got asked this question. Uh, where are we? Uh, is believing in extraterrestrial life unchristian? <laughs> I'm speaking from silence here for the most part, possibly. Um, if we're going to hold that Genesis 1 is the history of the, of the creation of the universe as we understand it, uh, days 1 through 3, we see that God creates kind of like the framework, and then days 4, 5, and 6, he fills in the framework. The problem is when Moses tells us what God did on days 4, 5, and 6, it's all from a, what we would call a geocentric perspective. It's only from the perspective of Earth. And this leads to all kinds of speculation of whether there is or is not life in the universe, and then it leads to all kinds of goofy ideas. Um, or creative ideas, depending on who you are. Some would argue that anyone who's seen an alien has really been um, faked out and tricked by a demon. I don't know that that's necessarily true. Uh, there are others who have used this metaphor um, in an idea that maybe there are, but they're isolated from us because of the fall of man on this planet. You see that C.S. Lewis in his three books called the Space Trilogy. If I had to guess, if there's a being out there who's similar to us, then I have to ask this question. Romans 8, Paul says this about creation. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. That, by the way, if you follow in Romans, would be Adam and uh, the sin that he brought in and hope that the creation itself will be would be liberated from its bondage, to decay, and brought into glorious freedom of the children of God. If that means that the fall of mankind creates all kinds of issues for all of the universe, and often in theological terms the fall is referred to as the universal fall, then that means anyone who's got a nature of free will, who can choose to honor and worship God, has also been introduced to the possibility of sin and falling away from God. Which would lead me to think that if they exist, then there has to be a way for the message of the gospel to reach them. Which then again leads to speculation. Again, we're speaking from silence at this point. I want to make that clear. Scripture does not speak of extraterrestrial life. It doesn't tell us. Um, but if they need to be redeemed, they need to know the message of a redeemer, which gives us one of two choices. One, Jesus has died in many different places in many different ways for people of different planets. The struggle with that would be the proclamation of the Hebrews writer that the sacrifice of God himself coming into the form as God the Son to provide the redemption of the universe is a once and for all action. Um, which means then if there's a universe of people out there somewhere then I would argue that we have to somehow reach them with the gospel. And this would lead me to believe that there may not be uh, extraterrestrial life like we know them. Personal opinion. What I would also point out that, especially, and I think this question comes from someone more of a science fiction kind of background and understanding. Note that we've always used the extraterrestrial as some sort of metaphor oftentimes in science fiction. The 50s, the alien is something from the outside that's coming to get us that we should be scared of. Uh, War of the Worlds, the pod people, uh, all those things that are coming from above to take us out. It's, it's, it's one way of manifesting fear. 
You get to the 60s and the 70s, and you get the guys who grew up with that trying to turn the message around. Uh, G. Roddenberry uses Star Trek as the idea of what happens when the world gets its act together, and then it will become this great force of enlightenment to the planet. As long as you ignore the fact that Captain Kirk is really very arrogant and screws up more stuff than he solves, it's a good idea. Um, Steven Spielberg talks about the different spaces of his life and how he used aliens. Close Encounter of the Third Kind, he's a man without kids who wants to go away and see something else, and he sees himself as Richard Dreyfus in that film who boards the plane after they play the do 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 do. Uh, but by the time he now has kids, he writes E.T. to deal with his life as a child of divorce and how he needed something to come into his world and redeem it. Uh, I would say there's probably someone greater who came from uh, off the planet, into the planet to do that, uh, Stephen. But, um, so, uh, to answer this question, I have no idea uh, whether uh, it is or is not. Um, I would be, I would be, I don't know. Hey, how's that for an answer? And I don't know. I'm not sure why this was the question I got asked, but this is what happens when you go away from your sermon plan. And let, uh, all right. Number three. Apparently, I did not do a good enough job with the stewardship series to explain this. How does planning for the future mesh with faithfulness to God's provision? In other words, should I just sit back and let things happen, or should I cause them to happen? If I cause them to happen, is God really in charge? And now we're dealing with uh, two theological camps. Uh, there's what's known as the Reformed view, or also known as Calvinism. And then there's the free will view of God's sovereignty, which is often uh, attributed to a guy by the name of Jacob Arminius, who was writing in response to Calvin. Um, and here's the question. If God's in charge and God's going to provide, then why do I do anything? Or do, do I do everything and really I'm in charge and God doesn't provide become the two extremes? The reality is there's a tension in Scripture between my responsibility and the fact that God's in charge. Um, if I were going to try to use a text to explain this, I'd look at this passage. James chapter 4. Uh, verse 13 through 15. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Very similar concept, Jesus tells the parable of the rich farmer who talks about how he's going to tear down his barns and build bigger barns, and Jesus warns him, what? You fool, do you not even know tonight is basically your last night on the planet? So is the answer then to passively sit back and just kind of wait for things to happen, or do we actively get involved in our lives? Some in the history of civilization have decided to get passive. We see this in 2 Thessalonians. Where hearing Paul write to them earlier that Jesus is coming back, some people said, that's it. Jesus is coming back. It happened in my lifetime. I can go ahead and stop doing everything right now. They sell everything. They go sit on a mountain. And then when Jesus doesn't come back, guess what starts to happen after about, oh, 8 to 12 hours? <laughs> Their stomach starts to rumble. So what happens is they're out of town on the hill sitting there. And they ask the people who are working and living in Thessalonica to bring them food. And Paul, when he writes the second letter, says, anybody know? You don't work, you don't work. If you don't work, you don't eat. In other words, if they decided that they're going to be passively sitting back and not involved in anything going on in this planet, let them starve to death. Let them meet Jesus that way, which seems fairly cruel for the apostle to write. <laughs> But there's a responsibility that we have. The question of the tension is this. And this is what I would, how I would answer the question based on this passage in James 4. It's not that we don't plan. But we've got to make sure that our plans are not so concrete that if what I choose to do does not come true, then somehow the whole universe is going to fall apart. The reality is, is the one who is in charge, the one who does know tomorrow, the one who is in control of the future, 
is not you. So there's a tension between being responsible and also knowing that the universe sometimes has other people involved in it, and it does have God who wants to do things from time to time, and they're allowed to change your plans without it completely ruining your day. That does not mean that you should just necessarily walk through life hoping that everything just kind of comes up roses for you, and there's no hard work, and there's no planning, and nothing like that goes into it, because God just doesn't care for, about what I do, so I should be uh, completely careful. Care, men, fancy, I'll get it right in a second. <laughs> Fun, fancy, and carefree, I believe is what Walt Disney taught me, is the phrase. Uh, does that satisfy the answer to the question, I hope? Uh, so it looks like we're going to have time for more questions from the pews at this rate. All right, question number four of five, just a warning. Why does God need angels or want angels? Why does God need or want angels? <laughs> um, the first question is need. I don't think God needs anything. This is the concept of God being all-powerful, all-sufficient. So it becomes a question of one desire. Um, we have some possibilities that I would throw out. Remember in Exodus where Moses goes up on the mountain and God says, you can't see my face. Because if you see my face, you will you'll not live, you'll die. Uh, no one has seen my face, or no one may see me and live. But Jesus says this, interestingly, in Matthew 18, which may lead us into an understanding of what angels do. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. This is where Jesus uh, invites the children to him. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. And we've seen that. These are the beings who are allowed to be in God's presence, and it doesn't kill them. They're not, they don't have the same limitations that mankind has in that aspect. So when they come and say, like in the Christmas, Mary, blessed mother full of grace, the Lord has said to me. Uh, the angel shows up and it's a message directly from God. Also interestingly, at least it would appear for children, they seem to have a guardian angel according to what Jesus says here. Or at least the angels are looking out at least for kids in some phase, shape, or fashion. Uh, be careful what you say to children because their angel so it seems to me that the angels have a responsibility with us in fact the writer of Hebrews says not all angels are ministering not, are not very helpful to get those words in the right order are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation so it seems that God has created the angels with one of their functions being to be servants to uh, Christians and those who are uh, the least of the redeemed. Um, so, angelology, uh, New, New Testament scholar Karl Barth said, is the hardest thing in all the Bible to understand. Um, what I can put together from those two things is it seems to be a way of knowing you're receiving a message from God, which is interesting, though, because the writer of Hebrews also says, or excuse me, Peter says in First Peter that the angels longed to look to the message that was revealed to us. So even God doesn't tell them everything when it came to the story of salvation. Um, and then we have the idea that they're here to serve us. All right. Before I ask the last question, anybody got a question from that I can try to answer completely off the cuff and see how bad I handle that, or if you've got something that you're just now thinking of. Because we've got about 10 minutes, and the next question will take about six. <laughs> Why do we not practice or talk about the Sabbath? Okay. All right. 
Um, let me do this. Saturday and Sunday, raise your hand. All right? Got about six, six hands up. Sabbath is Saturday. Raise your hand. All right? The Sabbath can be any day. Raise your hand. All right? We've got one for any day, a majority for Saturday, and most, uh, and, and then uh, the next group for Sunday. I think this becomes the issue. If we were four centuries ago, this would not be a problem. Uh, in fact, if we were a hundred years ago, this may not be a problem. A hundred years ago, the conclusion was that Sunday is the Sabbath. That's why there is still in some states what are known as blue laws, where certain uh, industries, certain organizations are closed on Sunday. It's probably why you still can't buy a car on Sunday in some states, because the idea was Sunday is the day that no one works because that's the day you go to church, and church and rest clearly are the same thing. <laughs> Well, I've seen a lot of people rest in years of uh, preaching. Um, uh, we're going back to the Ten Commandments, uh, obviously, is where the concept of Sabbath comes. Fourth Commandment. Fourth Commandment. Somebody look that up. I'm, I'm doing this completely on top of my head. Uh, is that honor your mother and your father? It's one of the first It's one of the first four. The first four deal with God in the last, it can't be, anyway, in the last six deal with others. Uh, where six days you were to work, and on the seventh you were to rest, because on six days God created the earth, and on the seventh day he ceased or he rest. Which was a distinction for Israel from all the other nations where they work seven days a week. An Israeli or a Jewish week was a Sunday through Saturday, so for those of you who said Saturday, as far as a Jewish person celebrating Sabbath, that would be Saturday. We see this with a few groups still today, not Jewish, like the Seventh Day Adventists, who try to figure out what time the sun's going down on Friday night, and um, all those kind of things. This was a distinguishing mark for Judaism that separated them from themselves from the other nations. It's also the only commandment not specifically restated in the New Testament, which has led some people to think to believe there's some freedom and others not to. Paul speaks of days being holy and different. In the, as the Colossians said, for some people it's a holy day, for others it's not. You set aside a day for you, you know, you decide what, whether each day is the same or certain days have special meaning or not. Which, by the way, may have implications for stuff like Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, whatever you want to call Resurrection Sunday slash Easter for people as well. Just throwing that out there. That it may be a day just like every other day, or maybe a special day depending on what you do with it. Uh, so there is no New Testament command for Sabbath, so we don't tell everybody, uh, you know what, at 6 o'clock on Friday, you better make sure you're done for the week, and you better not cook anything in your house, and you better turn off the wall, all the stuff, um, which was the first century understanding. You deal with Jesus dealing with Sabbath. The Pharisees have created all the rules and restrictions, and there's all kinds of laws that govern the Sabbath to the point where the Sabbath is a burden for people. And Jesus told them, uh, you've got it backwards. Man was not made for Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for man. Um, and we've taken that, in, especially within Protestantism and uh, Christianity, as an understanding of Sabbath is for us, not the other way around. Um, the concept of rest is probably a good idea. I would say that the distinction between Israel and the other nations is that every day is not just another day of work. That you do need a time of physical rest that allows you both to be physically rejuvenated and have time to focus on God. It may come into play with the question in James 4, where I'm not doing everything where I don't even consider what God has to say about this. Um, Hebrews 4, though, also mentions the fact that the Sabbath is a foretaste of the true Sabbath. Um, let me find that. I think it's the final verses in Hebrews. Um, Sabbath, the rest of God's people. Um, let me find it. Uh, yeah, chapter 4. Uh, verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. This is talking about after the people came into the promised land. They had Saturday. They had a Sabbath. 
But there's to speak that there is a greater rest coming. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own word, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter the rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. So the idea of the Sabbath also becomes a representation of what it means to make it through life completely faithful and the ceasing of the struggle that we have on the other side of eternity. Um, but if you want me to give you principles of what you must and must not do and which day of the week and that kind of stuff, the reason that we don't teach on it is there's really not any New Testament teaching on the idea. Um, and the struggle is you can become extremely legalistic when you decide to start creating sadness for other people. I would suggest and recommend that if you really need a restful Sabbath, that the summer is a great time to find a very restful activity. Uh, there's this one sporting event I know that is very relaxing, that is played at a leisurely pace to the point where you can enjoy your time with the people you're there. You can rest, you can relax, you can eat hot dogs if you want to, which you shouldn't. Uh, you prefer ballparks with Coca-Cola, and you can just enjoy that. That would be my suggestion. Um, and I think that's it. I think you find a recreation. Uh, no, by the way, the word recreation, re-creation, uh, which comes to the point of being have to recreate yourself. So my suggestion is, in my mandatory phrases, I'd like to remind you that on May 9th, uh, there is Home Plate Detroit. We're collecting them. See how I work in a shameless plug for that fellowship <laughs> event uh, with the Tigers. <laughs> It's even more relaxing and recreation though if you move about four and a half hours south to a ballpark down by the river uh, and watch National League Baseball without a designated thing the way God actually had created it on uh, day six before Adam and Eve fell after that point. So, other than the nonsense about baseball at the end. But I found a way to work it in one last time before the year ended. All right. Uh, we spent about five, six weeks on, on eschatology, and I, apparently I did not answer this question effectively, because uh, I got asked about it. When you die, where do you go? Uh, heaven or wait for Christ's return? So, uh, first of all, context of the question would seem to indicate the question of what happens to a Christian when they die, so that's all I'm going to answer. Um, <coughs> to uh, the first person we know who got to enter Christ's kingdom is the thief on the cross where Jesus said an interesting thing to him. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him and said, well, I'll tell you the truth. Thousands of years from now, when I come back, you will be with me. No, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Um, <laughs> One of the things we've always said in the restoration movement is we try to call biblical things by biblical names. So whether you want to consider this heaven or paradise, I would argue that we go to the place that the Bible refers to as paradise. Um, what it means is what Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians, that I'm confident to say that I would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Uh, which I believe that when we die, as, a, as one in Christ, we find ourselves, wherever we are, God's there. However, if you're saying that as the ultimate heaven idea that we often have, I can't agree with that because of two things. To be present where God is means that I'm absent from something of my own, which is my body. Uh, if you remember what we talked about in Second Corinthians, uh, Second First Corinthians, First Thessalonians, chapter four, the resurrection of the body is a important part to the story of the gospel. That we will be raised just as Christ was raised, because our physical body is also transformed. That comes with us into the eternal kingdom. The other thing that tells me that it's not complete, so you don't just go ahead and enter all of eternity is there's another part to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that was very important when we studied it. Paul had the right to comfort those who were still here, that those who had died would not lose out on anything, which means 
there has to be those who are still alive <laughs> and those who have died in Christ have to be together. Um, some of you may, this may be helpful, especially in the season we're in. We've just come from the holidays. Anybody who celebrated the holidays without every family member there knows it was a celebration and it was a family celebration, but it wasn't a family celebration. <laughs> Because there were people who weren't there. There's the ability to begin even when everybody is coming. There's the ability to say, we're at Christmas. But it really becomes Christmas when everybody is finally there. Make sense? I don't know what your family traditions are. Uh, let's use the Christmas analogy, though. Uh, everybody is not here yet, which means there are certain things we're not going to do. You can't eat yet in some houses. You can't open the gifts yet. So you can't have that fulfillment of the holiday until everybody is settled around the house. And generally the patriarch makes that decision or the matriarch. Generally, you know, whoever's in charge decides when Christmas is really fully, finally realized. So I think the idea of what we often think of is that point where wherever we are, we're going to be there forever. Um, we have a taste of it. Uh, we're already experiencing the fact that we're with the Lord, we will there, we will always be, but we're not fully seeing the realization of the promise of the restoration of all things uh, that comes with the gospel because we're not all together yet. Um, so I don't think we're just in a slumber spot. The other thing is the idea of paradise, the only other place I know that really speaks in this concept is Luke chapter 15, which is a parable, but because Jesus refers to Lazarus and a certain man, some think that it's not a parable, that Jesus is actually counting an event that occurs between paradise and the holding or the place where those who are going to ultimately find themselves eternally condemned are also held. And this becomes very problematic because if we all go to heaven just whenever we die, that would mean that and there is a sense of time. Today you will be with me, Jesus says to the thief. Uh, in Revelation, we see the martyrs under the throne who seem to understand some concept of time when they ask Jesus, how much longer before you avenge our death? Uh, if there's a concept of time that they can possess, then it seems to be very unfair that if you have rejected the message of God and rejected Him, that you can spend more time in hell because you were born in time before someone else did. Uh, of all the things that come up about hell, that would seem to be the most unjust. That because I was born in uh, 700 BC instead of 2000 AD, <coughs> then I get an extra two, two millennium in hell. That doesn't necessarily seem like the, that seems like excessive punishment where your jail time is not based on your birth time. Um, but I would expect, that's again speculation. Okay? What we attempt to do when, when we're answering these questions is help people know that we're witnesses to what Jesus has done and get, letting them know what happens to them and what the alternative is when they do pass on. Uh, and even if this is a question and answer time, not necessarily a sermon, if today's a day where you need to know more about what Jesus has done so you can have a better feeling and understanding of where you would find yourself when you die. So our worship team comes. We're going to give you a song of invitation this morning if you need to respond. And also, let this sermon be a note to you that... Um, if you've got questions, I'll try to answer them. If I don't know the answer, I'll hem a haul around a little bit before I tell you I really don't know the answer as well. But I'd be more than willing to try to help you and help myself look and see what God has said about that topic. So, this morning, if you need to make a decision or if you need to think of other questions that you would like us to pursue, talk to the opportunity as we stand for a song of invitation.